Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. As I hope you know by now, we are studying the Sabbath School lessons prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is for the first three months of 2014. This particular lesson is lesson number 12 for March 22 of 2014, and it's entitled The Harvest and the Harvesters. I hope you've enjoyed these lessons. This last couple of lessons we have coming up I have some really thought-provoking things to say. I hope you've got your all ears, you've got your Bible handy, and to ask the Holy Spirit to guide us, let's bow our heads in prayer. Our loving Father, I'm sure that you are concerned as we are that there's been a long delay. We know that you're waiting for us to get ready. Peter made that clear, others have made it clear. May these lessons be a help in moving in that direction. May we all recognize our need to become involved in bringing all things to an end. May we understand the gospel more clearly, and may we find better ways to present it to our neighbors and friends is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we, uh, this particular lesson is called The Harvest and the Harvesters. In our last lesson, we talked about preparing disciple makers. And this lesson really is, to a considerable extent, in a, a continuation of that lesson. And it focuses on Jesus' instructions and how they were carried out by his disciples in the first century. Now, if you think about it, remember there were some called and some called and some called, and then finally, or, or just they came to Jesus. And then finally, about two years into his ministry, he called a group as he began his ministry in Galilee. Uh, that, he chose that, that group of 12. After praying all night, discussing with his father, he called those 12, or he called actually 11, and Judas insisted on joining them, so he accepted him. Um, and then he was, began a very serious training program for them. And at, before too long, he sent them out to minister in Galilee, not to the Samaritans, not to the Gentiles, but to Galilee, where he had previously worked himself. And we'll talk about all the implications of that. Now, in our modern world, we have a lot of people who think they know how to make leaders, think they know how to do this and that and the other thing. But let's not forget that the kind of leaders we're talking about in this study are people who take seriously Bible study, prayer, witnessing, and the need to service others in order to be really Christian. We need to recognize our sinfulness. We need to be grateful what the Holy Spirit has done for us, and even grateful for the giving of the scriptures and the giving of, in our case, the writings of Ellen White. Paul described that <coughs> burden to, to give the message to others as a kind of fire burning inside. In fact, he called himself a slave. What do you think he meant when he called himself a slave? It was never uh, forgotten. It was never out of his mind. Mm -hmm. it burned in him. Yeah. He, he, he couldn't just sit home and be quiet. Yeah. This was, you know, he had a fire burning in him. He, he couldn't. And that's what we need today. We need people with a fire burning inside them. Um, here's another question. Why didn't God just send a group of angels? They could appear as human beings, and they could do a much better job than we can. Couldn't, couldn't they have been sent down to finish the gospel? Are you sure they could do a better job than we can? Well, why not? Well, first of all, you said they would come in and appear as men. They'd be lying right there, wouldn't they? No. Well, wouldn't they? <laughs> you mean because I mean, if they're they, if they go people? out and start knocking on doors and just appearing like men and telling them about Jesus and then going to the next one... They knocked They're, on Abraham's door. Well, they knew, Abraham knew who they were, too. After a while, he figured it out. Yeah. I, I think people could figure that out after a while. Why would okay, they? but then, then um, would people start being... Suspicious? Well, no, wouldn't they? Would they start maybe becoming Christian because of authority instead, <coughs> of, instead of the truth? Well, I mean, that's a possibility, Jay. What we, well, I was going to say... We're, we're, some, some mention was made that they appeared as, as humans. Well, wouldn't it be more effective if they appeared as angels? <laughs> there you go. 
<laughs> I, I would think that would have a greater impact. And in fact, uh, 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 an imitation or, <coughs> or pretend Jesus is going to come and do exactly that at the end. That's exactly what Satan is going to do. Appear as an angel. He's going to and he's going to be claimed to be claim to be Jesus Christ. Well, he is an angel. He is an angel. He was an angel. Would they have had the human perspective though over no. time? No. No. Why is that perspective so important? Well, I think there's another thing that we've overlooked. I think God has given us this job because we need to do it. If you want to find out how well you understand something, you want to figure out how well you understand one of our doctrines, go and try to explain it to somebody who has a completely different understanding. Just try it. Well, but of course we're dealing you and I and around this table, we're dealing with that kind of a situation, but the universe is dealing more on a cosmic mm -hmm. circumstance. So <clears throat> how is it that humans engaged in this are more effective even on a cosmic level? Well, for <coughs> Ephesians and Colossians, Paul says very clearly that we, I mean, in First Corinthians, we are a spectacle. We have the theater to the universe. In fact, we are supposed to teach the angels something about God. Look at, look at Ephesians 3, 7 to 10. We're supposed to teach the angels something about God. Is that happening consciously, or is that just the way things have worked out providentially? I, I think what happens there, I think what's happening is we're, we're teaching by default. Mm -hmm. They are learning about the terrible consequences of sin. I was reading, uh, you mentioned, as in your introduction there, Ken, <clears throat> about the calling of the, yeah. well, not the calling of the twelve disciples, kind of the naming of the twelve yeah. apostles, I guess. And you mentioned that um, Judas really wasn't a, a prime consideration of Jesus, but the other disciples were encouraging that, and, uh, and that, that Judas himself was pushing that. Mm -hmm. um, where do you get that information? I was reading, I mean, I've, that's been my understanding as well, but I was reading in Luke the other evening, and uh, I think it was uh, um, 5 here where he's naming these, mm -hmm. chapter 5. <clears throat> and it doesn't say anything about, it does mention Judas the traitor mm -hmm. as the last one mentioned, but it doesn't mention anything about what Jesus didn't, this wasn't anybody Jesus wanted, it okay. just kind of snuck in here. That, uh, that <clears throat> is information from Desire of Ages, from Alan White who saw this in vision. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's why I think she had a little more information than some of the rest of us do. Well, let's, let's, do you remember, when were the first, when did the first disciples start following Jesus? Well, not a trick question. Well, you're not talking necessarily about the apostles, you're talking about the very first disciples. The very first disciples, when did they first start following Jesus? Well, when was when was the first time he? Uh, of course, the 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 the, the wedding. They came to him. He didn't call them first. Was it after he stood up in uh, in the synagogue there and read no, that? Just baptism, huh? Right after his baptism, yeah. And remember, John the Baptist said, "Here's the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world." And they're saying, "Whoa, we haven't heard that before." we got to check this guy out. And they said, Rabbi, where do you live? And he said, well, come with me and see. And then they started telling their friends, look, look at that's found in John chapter 1. Look at verse 43. This is a little bit later. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, come with me. Now, this is the next day. Philip was from Bethsaida, the town where Andrew and Peter lived. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one whom Moses wrote about in the book of the law and whom the prophets also wrote about. He is Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. And you know, of course, he's the tip, the, 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 we usually talk about what comes next. Can anything good come from Nazareth, Nathanael said? I mean, think about it. If you knew that, let's say the United States, if we knew that there was a certain person who was going to eventually be president and they were going to lead this country to glorious victories. And all of a sudden said, someone said, we found him. I mean, what would be our response? I mean, there would be nothing to the Jews. This was the biggest news that ever happened. The Messiah is here. Think about it. 
I would ask him, how do you know that? And what would he say? He'd say, because John said he, but this is the one. He, and, and what was the response? Come and see. Come and see. Okay, but does that really give you evidence for the argument? Well, he, if, you, if you want to read on here, he, Nathaniel shows up and, and Jesus says, I saw you when you were already, when you were back there under the tree. And the guy says, how did you know that? I mean, you know, in effect. And, 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 and Jesus answered, um, Jesus said, do you believe just because I told you I saw you were you under the fig tree? You will see much greater things than this. And he said to them, I am telling you the truth. You will see heaven open and God's angels up, going up and coming down on the Son of Man. Right there is just words. Though. Yeah, but well, I mean... And plus yeah. the other thing, you know, um, when he went to that disciple, he said he was kind of hard to win over, wasn't he? But then when Jesus said, Should I saw you under the tree, anybody could have said that. Yeah, but I mean, the idea is it wasn't just over right over there. He, this was a long way away. He saw him when he wasn't, when he wasn't physically able to see him well, under the he tree. He said that. What? I mean, he said he saw him yeah. under the tree. Yeah, and no. that's why I think Jesus was so surprised that he would, he would um, believe him so easily, because of just those words, yeah. you know. So I don't know. If well, we're if we're really so important, why is it that Jesus said um, <clears throat> that even the stones would cry out if, if the humans did not? Uh, well, I asked you a little while ago. If, what would happen if the angels came and you didn't get excited about that? What if the stones started crying out? Would that be better? Well, but my question was, if the stones will cry out, then why do, why do we need humans here to? Well, I don't know. Stones, you know, people have jokingly talked about that. Some of me said, well, yeah, the stones are crying out. That's what archaeology is all about. I don't think that's what he meant. Though. <laughs> <laughs> you don't think that's what he meant? I don't know what he meant because uh, how does how does stones cry out? Uh, was it just a figure of speech? I'm not sure. It I don't wasn't. know. No, I think I think it was I think it was real. I could see these stones all of a sudden develop a mouth and start talking. And, yeah, we're and is that what is that what's going to happen? I don't know if they do that, <laughs> but. Uh, I think Jesus was, I'm sure that Jesus was saying at least this much. He was saying is, you can't stop this message even if you buried the stones. Right. You know, yeah, this message, this message is going to go and you have no way to stop it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's what he meant. Yeah, yeah. Well, Andrew called Peter and pretty soon all, we hear a whole bunch about Peter and we hear almost nothing about Andrew. Do you think Andrew was ever jealous? They did get jealous of each other, didn't they? Well, I'm asking you, but there's nothing. There's nothing specifically said about Andrew being jealous. But the whole the whole group of disciples seemed each one seemed to want to have his own special place. <laughs> yeah. There's a story told, and um, I probably should have looked up this reference, but a story told about an evangelist who went to Ireland and conducted a series of meetings, and he was. He spent apparently a fair amount of money, a lot of effort. People helped him. And he baptized one person. And he thought, man, that was a waste. And that person turned out to be, I believe it was, the grandfather of Billy Graham. So you have to decide, was converting one person a waste or not? So perhaps it might be concluded that if you're an evangelist and you held a big campaign and you only got one convert, then you should be <clears throat> rejoicing because that one convert must really account for something, must really going to be worth something. He must have been serious about it. If he, you know, if a whole crowd is, 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 is you know, joining the up and baptizing at the same time, well, it's easy to get swept along. But if you're the only one and you make a decision, then you, it's, it's I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that that's what we ought to do in all our evangelistic campaigns, but, but it's true. One person standing alone they better have a conviction about what they're doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, why has there been such a long delay? Here it is, 2014. We are now almost 170 years from the disappointment. Mm -hmm. What do you think is, is happening? What are we waiting for? 
Is, is God a little, getting a little slow in his actions here? No. We yeah. haven't carried the load we should have. <laughs> we haven't carried our load, huh? Well, the, the most famous verse in the Bible about that probably is found in Second Peter 3. Um, and you could start from the beginning. It talks about, you know, people are going to believe that, you know, since the world began, nothing has changed. Everything just slowly and gradually, etc. But when you get down to verse 10, it says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day the heavens will disappear with a shrill noise. The heavenly bodies will burn up and be destroyed, and the earth with everything in it will vanish. Since all these things will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people should you be? Your lives should be holy and dedicated to God as you wait for the day of God. What do you suppose that's talking about? The coming. Isn't that the second coming? And do your best to make it come soon. The day when the heavens will burn up and be destroyed and the heavenly bodies will melt melted by the heat. So we are supposed to be doing something to make it come soon. How well are we doing at that? Well, <coughs> who's... Is that what it's saying, though? Do you think it's saying that, that everything's being held back because of what we're not doing? Absolutely. It didn't quite say that to me on that. It didn't? No. Why it, not? It says, it says to work, to work the, the speed is coming. Well, so and if you're not working and you're not speeding is coming, then what happens? It gets delayed. Well, I don't know. I don't know. It just says to work. Just because it doesn't come in my lifetime, let's say, that doesn't mean that... Uh, my efforts haven't hastened it in one way or the other. No, the, the mm. thing that bothers me is that, you know, it all comes down to performance again. <coughs> we're not performing correctly, and so we're holding up everything. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you really subscribe to that? Well, between the sixth and seventh uh, trumpet in the book of Revelation, mm -hmm. it talks about a group called the 144,000. And it says that those people... Well, goes on to say that those people will be people who receive the seal of God and carry the three angels' messages to the world. Yeah. How well are we doing at that? If you go out here on the streets of San Bernardino and ask somebody, what are the three angels' mm. messages and what do they mean? Mm. And they don't live very far from you either. Isn't that, isn't that, <laughs> something, when the, isn't that something that happens when the Spirit comes? He needs some help. He's asking us to help him. That's the whole point. He's not asking us to do it by ourselves. And I hope nobody thought we were suggesting we do it by ourselves. Well, um, but the Holy Spirit says, I'm waiting for you to join me. I don't know. It just seems to me like, you know, the Lord knows what all needs to be done mm -hmm. for eternity yeah. to make sure that everything is covered. Okay. I don't, I don't know if, if, well, let me ask if you. us doing something correct or not, you know, performing correct, and it's going to speed things up to okay, cover let me all ask, that. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Do you think Jesus depended upon his Father and the Holy Spirit to get his work done while he was here? You, sure. Okay. D did Jesus choose disciples? Sure. Did, they, did he expect them to help him while he was spreading the gospel here, while he was here? But there's no way they can tell whether something like that has sped up anything or not. That's, well, that's my but, point. Well, well, you're right. Okay. You're, you're true, you, but that's exactly true. You know, they have to do the work, but show me where something is slowed down it's impossible. or sped up. It's impossible because it, it happened the way it happened, and you can't say whether this... But the, my point would be God chose those people and, and in de invested a lot of effort into preparing those people for what they're going to do later, but he clearly intended for them to do something, doesn't? And, he, and remember that he said this is going to be the former reign, and the latter reign is going to be much greater. So where are the disciples who are going to do the latter reign? Seems to me like that's pretty clear. Of course, if if I can do something to hasten it, mm -hmm. the coming. <clears throat> isn't it reasonable to conclude that there are others who can do things to delay it? Mm -hmm. So it would be easy for me to say, well, I'm working like mad to uh, do everything I can to hasten it, but there's all these other people that are undoing everything I, I'm doing. How, how 
how do we how do we deal with that potential? Well, let's that, let's that, read that, his that, instructions that, to that, it, that it can actually you can hasten it and then you can also delay it. Unhasten it. Gary over there, he's constantly <laughs> interfering well, with my ability to hasten things. <laughs> I see. Okay. Well, but let's think about that for a moment. That's, that's a fair question. Let's let's think about that for a minute. Is there anybody that's doing their absolute utmost to delay things? Yeah, Satan. <laughs> Satan. Of course, Satan. Because the longer it delays, the longer he can stay alive, right? Yep. So whose side are we on here? Yeah, it shouldn't be on his side. Well, <clears throat> if, we're, if we want things to be delayed, you know where you are or where yeah, we are. That's right. It's one well, let's, the look at, let's look at the instructions Jesus gave to those first disciples. I'm, I'm looking now at Matthew 10, starting with the last part of verse 5. And maybe, let, me read, let me read all of verse 5. These 12 men were sent out by Jesus with the following instructions. Does this, does this say anything to us here now, or this is irrelevant? Just do not go to any Gentile territory or any Samaritan towns. Instead, you are to go to the lost sheep of the people of Israel. Does that, what does that say? Go and preach the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, bring the dead back to life, Heal those who suffer from dreaded skin diseases, and of course that's leprosy, at least that's the way it's translated usually, and drive out demons. You have received without paying, so go without being paid. Do not carry any gold, silver, or copper money in your pockets. Do not carry a beggar's bag for the journey or an extra shirt or shoes or a stick. Workers should be given what they need. When you come to a town or a village, go in and look for someone who's willing to welcome you and stay with him until you leave that place. When you go into a house, say, Peace be with you. If the people in that house welcome you, let your greeting of peace remain. But if they do not welcome you, then take back your greeting. I'm sorry I said hi, I guess. <laughs> and if some, home, if some home or town will not welcome you or listen to you, then leave that place and shake the dust off your feet. I assure you, that on the judgment day, God will show more mercy to the people of Sodom and Gomorrah than to the people of that town. If you were to pick out, if you were just asked to somebody who knew a little bit about the Bible and you would ask them to pick out one of the most sinful places in the Bible, what would they pick? Sodom and Gomorrah. Probably Sodom and Gomorrah. So when I go to somebody's door and I knock on their door because I have this lovely piece of good Christian literature to give them, and they slam the door in my face, <clears throat> then... They haven't killed you yet. Then they're going to be in real trouble. Is that, is that worse than I, Sodom I just, and Gomorrah? I'm just reading you what it says here. <clears throat> so well, is there, are you making a point? I mean, I know... I, I'm asking that. you. I mean, the, the lesson, our lesson said... Okay, here's what he said to his first disciples. Mm -hmm. Does that say anything to us? It doesn't say get into an argument with them. No. It just says <laughs> dust your it feet says, off. It says don't, don't get yeah. into argument. Just go dust your feet off and go to the next place. And uh, So are you trying to bring up the fact that they're going from place to place and we're not doing that? Is that well, what you're saying? they went to Galilee. Galilee's not in a large area. Yeah. But he's, he sent them out two by two. Mm -hmm. and said, cover the territory. Now, are these the instructions for this particular mission trip? Yeah. Are these instructions for a lifestyle? Well, I mean, that's one of the questions we need to talk about, we need to think about, because, yeah, <clears throat> because later he gave slightly different instructions to the 70 or 72 when he sent them out, and that was in Gentile territory. Well, what about verse 23? Yeah. It's right on the end, you could take that two ways. Uh, when they Verse 23? Yeah, of chapter 10. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Now that has to be figured if they are day. Yeah. Because I don't think there were that many towns in Israel mm -hmm. that time. Yeah, and there are not that many towns in Israel. And, 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 and you know, how long? It sounds like... It, 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 there's even later, he says, some people will be alive here right. to see Jesus come. Now, we have another way of interpreting that, but where did, where did that happen? <laughs> what, what, does the mean, what is the meaning of that verse, though, that um, you won't go to all the towns before the Lord comes? 
But I, I, I think probably what that means is that the, the go if the gospel is spread the way it's supposed to be, you tell a couple of people and they, you keep talking to others and they start telling other people and it's supposed to spread over the whole world until everybody hears. And when everybody hears, not all of them are going to decide to be Christians, but when everybody hears, God will say, okay, everybody's had their chance, that's it. Okay. Well, maybe we just need to get a bunch of loudspeakers on some airplanes and mm, no. fly over everywhere. And Why would you waste your time doing that when there's the internet? Well, well some people don't have internet. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and all you need is that one person to mess the whole thing up, right? And you have to wait till that Somebody one person. Somebody be born goes. after you've flown over. <laughs> yeah. Well, what about the keys to the kingdom? Is that is that what we need? The keys to the kingdom, and and Peter's the only one who got those. Uh, it's a misapplication. A misapplication. How do you know that? <laughs> I'm I'm not trying to be difficult, but but look at. Uh, Matthew 18, um, verse 18. And so I tell all of you, what you prohibit on earth will be prohibited in heaven. What you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. So he gave the keys to all of his disciples. All of them. More than that, for... Yeah, not just Peter. And for those of us who are Adventists, look at this comment from Ellen White. Peter had expressed the truth, which is the foundation of the church's faith, and Jesus now honored him as the representative of the whole body of believers. He said, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The keys of the kingdom of heaven are the words of Christ. All the words of Holy Scripture are his, all of them, and are here included. These words have power to open and to shut heaven. They declare the conditions upon which men are received or rejected. Thus, the work of those who preach God's word is a savor of life unto life or of death unto death. Theirs is a mission weighted with eternal results. And that's Desire of Ages 413 and 414. In other words, if you go to someone's place and you open the Bible to them, are you, you know, do you, you walk up the door and they let's see, I'm like, this is a pretty nice looking house. Uh, yeah, these people look nice. I'll give them the keys to heaven. Next one, no, I don't like this place. You know, they're, they're not keeping the yard nice. I'll give them the keys to hell. To hell. Is that the way it works? Yeah. How does it work? You, you present the Bible to them, and then they either respond to it or they don't. They're the ones who choose whether these keys are going to be for heaven or for hell on their, ha on their own behalf. You just present the word of God to them. Okay? Which, Jesus also told his... Yes? No, that's fine. Oh, Jesus also told his disciples to treat this task as very urgent. They're not supposed to greet people on the way. Does that mean you can't even say hi? Why, why did Jesus tell them not to greet people on the way? Is that like not to be distracted? Yeah. And if you, if you see people from the Middle East, when they greet somebody, especially if somebody they haven't seen for a while, the greetings go on for a long time. This is, how are you? And how's the family? How's your wife? How are the kids? Where have you been? What have you been doing? Da, da, da. And of course, that person is asking you to answer all those same questions. And Jesus said, we've got a job to do here. And there's nothing wrong with those things, but right now, we need to focus on the job. So you'd be um, a little bit rude and say, sorry, i got to do something and leave? <laughs> no, well, I don't know if you say anything. <laughs> Greet him in the name of God, I guess. Yeah. So <clears throat> does that mean um, I need to give up my golfing? Does that mean I need to... Um, I don't know. Is, I, I, if, shouldn't, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't be uh, spending time with my stamp collecting. Um, mm -hmm. I, need, I need to just... Distraction? Yeah. I, 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 how intent is... Am I supposed to be in... Is everybody supposed to be like Paul? Well, <coughs> as far as we know, every one of the disciples except John died a martyr's death. 
They must have taken this pretty seriously. It was a full-time job for them. Now, Paul sometimes worked all night so he could preach all day. I don't know how many of us can do that. It gets harder as you get older, let me tell you about that. <laughs> but what... So we're telling... We, we, you're hemming and hawing here. Speak right into the camera and tell <laughs> the audience. No. Point your finger and say... Okay. <laughs> no more golfing. No. no more sitting watching the football game. No more going down and paying for tickets to watch the Dodgers. Okay, or say, wait. What? 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 <laughs> that's that's next week's lesson. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we'll, but I might not be here next week. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jesus said, or I shouldn't say, people have taken Jesus' words and said it's like one beggar telling other beggars where to find the bread. How do you feel about that expression? Is that kind of, kind of a childish kind of a way of presenting things? I've never heard that one before until I read it. Really? Yeah, that's a new way to me. Well, if uh, a beggar knows where the bread is... I can tell you, uh, we, the, at the clinic where I work, right across our park, on our property, the part of our services on the other side of our parking lot is a, two buildings, and one of them is a pantry. And we cooperate with a number of churches who make it part of their job is collecting food from people who are willing to do score stores and so forth. They're willing to donate. We feed 1,500 families a week. You get there at 7 o'clock, 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning, and the parking lot is jam full. Now, obviously, people are willing to gather if there's bread. So how do we make the gospel that attractive? You have a dinner and then you preach. Well, that's a possibility. I think, to me, it's, it's a combination of things. We are supposed to take advantage of opportunities, and I think also we are supposed to work at finding opportunities yeah. and utilizing them. Mm -hmm. Well, there are people who aren't there in that bread line, and it's because they have plenty of bread. So, should we, should we draw a conclusion here from this comparison that maybe we need to go where people don't have the bread? How well, can we find those people yeah. that don't have the bread and show them that we do have the bread? How do we, how, how do, we do that? Well, once again, I can only speak from my experience, but I'm, I have been trying to speak to people a, a little bit more in my work is seeing a lot of patients and many of them are poor people <clears throat> and I've started saying offering to pray with people I mean you can't believe the response I get from the most unbelievable people some people think well, I, I, I'm not even bothered telling this guy you know that I'm willing to pray for him and they come back and they say I can't leave until you pray for me yeah. you know, I I, I've had actual people tell me they come because they want, they want me to pray for them. That's why they came to the doctor. Well, but the clientele that I live, the realm that yeah. I live in... is a little different. They... Hmm. They... If, if... And that most of us live in. Hmm. If, uh, if they are spiritually hungry, they don't know that. Mm -hmm. um, how would you... or uh, what if they're not spiritually hungry? What if they're just spiritually ignorant? Mm -hmm. So, if they are spiritually ignorant, are they really spiritually hungry and just don't know it? How do you... Well, that's one of the big questions. <clears throat> and it's a question we're probably going to talk more about next week. But it, and, and the ne and our next lesson is a pretty, pretty serious lesson, I will tell you. Um, but it's part of the question is this. Historically, there's no question about it, historically, the church grows fastest under persecution. Right. And the words that that's described as is the, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And, and hard, now, why is that? And hard times leading up to that. I think that's Probably what you're seeing. The greatest impediment to anybody changing their or, or searching for something is if they're comfortable. 
economically and health-wise, if they're comfortable, why should they change? Because God is blessing them if they're <laughs> well off and uh, so well, forth. Let, let's, let, so let's look at that situation. Many of us go to church. We're comfortable. We sit there and someone says, you should go out and evangelize. They say, well, my, I mean, we pay the pastor to do that, right? Mm. Isn't that the common re sort of response? I mean, maybe we don't say it out loud, but that's what we think. So now let me ask, we're, we're talking about Jesus as our example. Who is the most qualified evangelist you ever heard of on this earth? Jesus, right? Yeah. Yet he sent his disciples with almost no preparation. I mean, relatively little preparation. He sent his disciples out to do it. Is he saying, I I'm sorry, I'm not capable of doing this job myself? I don't think so. Why did he send them out? They were at least equipped just by the where they were born to approach a large segment of the population. So also, also they uh, going out and talking with people, they began to find out where those people's head was at. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. And so then, then, and I'm sure that if they had any conversation going, they had some disagreements, mm -hmm. and, and they probably need to go back and get some fortification yeah. and do some more study and learn from the master. So it, it was, it, it and, worked. And well. learn from each other. Of course. Yeah, because yeah. you got six teams of two each, mm -hmm. and they each had different experiences, I'm sure. Um, and we, again, if we look at the New Testament, every one of us has given, been given talents, skills, abilities, and probably other ones that we really have that we don't realize we have because we haven't called them into action. And sometimes it's easy. Even the pastor might say, well, I know who in my church can, can do something. But remember that Jesus chose these 12 of the 11 plus Judas, and he sent them out, even Judas, to evangelize Galilee. Um, what are we supposed to learn from that? It stirred up quite a bit of persecution. Yeah. So, is one of the things we should conclude is the reason there isn't persecution is because <clears throat> we're not out. Um, well, let me pointing out sin or shall I shall I give the Bible verse? <coughs> Second Timothy, all who live godly lives in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. How many of you had persecution this week? Well, I've had it, but not for that. <laughs> <laughs> I see. <laughs> well, who Jesus. Who do you know has persecution? <laughs> what? Who do you know that has Oh, there, there are some parts of the world where there's definitely persecution. Well, I know the parts of the world, but anywhere around the neighborhood here. No. So there must not be anybody preaching the good word yeah. right now. Uh, just think about <laughs> it. And, and this is a question for the church. Think about this also. That I, I've really scratched my head on this one. If you look around, and if you, if you get a world gathering of believers, like the General Conference or something like that, and they bring in a report, and you find out that the Holy Spirit really right now is working in India, should we be pouring a lot of money into India, where things are really happening right now, and then maybe next time it'll be, God is really working in China, so we're going to focus our... Or do we just sort of limp along everywhere, hoping that in some places we're doing almost nothing, it seems, and other places the fire is going... How should we relate to those kind of things? I don't think you get persecution until some way or another you tread on somebody's corns, be it high or low. Yeah. And so far, I don't think we've done it. Well, I can tell you that there are, pla there are places in India where they made it against the law sure. to change religions. Yeah. In Muslim countries, it's against the law to try to convert a Muslim. Exactly. Maybe that's why things are moving along. Now, uh, also in Muslim countries, there's a lot of Muslim countries that have almost bereft of Christians now because they, you know, kill them off or chase them out. How are we going to get back to those people? And another question, there, every church has legitimate needs. Somebody needs to clean the church, somebody needs to, you know, lock the place up, take care of it, open the door, start the furnace, whatever on Sabbath, if it's a cold place. You know, someone need, there are things to be done. Someone needs to give the, run the Sabbath school. Someone needs to give the reports, da, da, da. We're no arguing about that. 
But often, amidst all that, we, we, we develop these petty differences. Someone doesn't like the way someone did it or whatever like this, and they're arguing about this back and forth. What would happen if we said, okay, everybody needs to be out there doing something to spread the gospel? Don't you think a lot of those petty differences would sort of disappear? You know, Ellen White actually suggested once, and I think more than once, that once in a while we ought to have church services where everybody comes together and just says, what have you been doing in the last couple of weeks to share the gospel? I, I, I used to be working in Africa, and uh, for a while I was working in Nairobi, Kenya, and I was working in the doctor's office upstairs, and downstairs was the dental office, and the dentist was down there. And we lived in side-by-side -side apartments on the third floor, so dental office, doctor's office, apartments. And every afternoon, every evening after work, we would stand out there, had a nice balcony looking out over, and it was beautiful weather and so forth. And we, every day we would come, okay, have you heard anything from the Lord today? That was the question we always asked, have you heard anything from the Lord today? And every day it seemed like something would happen to one or the other of us or both of us that said, you know, God is working here. Now, is that, is that only possible in Africa or is it possible in the USA? Okay. What about uh, language we use when we talk about people who aren't members of our church? Does that turn anybody off? You outsiders? Can and it has. You rebels? <laughs> <coughs> what, what language? Yeah. The, it's the very, type of language you, 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 you use. You never call them outsiders, do you? It's very easy to be derisive without even thinking about it. Yeah. I think that goes for humanity in general, not just us. Well, I'm just thinking about things that might stand in the way of our sharing the gospel. There's, there's three stories that Jesus told in Luke 15 that might give us some clues. Remember the story about the one sheep that was lost out of the hundred? The story of the woman who lost one coin out of ten, and then the prodigal son, the one son that was lost out of two. What do you think those stories are supposed to tell us about sharing the gospel? I mean, we could sit here and make, I mean, lots of sermons have been done about this, but, but the, the sheep at least knew it was lost, right? Mm -hmm. And the shepherd left the other 99 potentially in, ha at, in hazardous situations to go and rescue that one. The coin, of course, has no consciousness at all. It has, doesn't even know it's lost. So why did the woman go looking for it? It's basically all she had. Well, it had intrinsic value, didn't it? So she looked for it because it had value. The sheep had value. What about the sun? You know, I hadn't thought about this before, but the, what, one of the messages in these two parables might be that um, <clears throat> in the case of the shepherd that uh, <clears throat> that this was a very precious thing. Mm -hmm. The coin was a very precious thing. Okay, so now, thank you. That's what I wanted you to say. <laughs> Appreciate it very much. What does Jesus say <laughs> happens when someone goes and brings one of those sheep back again? Do you remember? Rejoicing There's more in rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repents. <coughs> now we're talking about getting sinners to repent here, aren't we? Mm -hmm. More rejoicing. Do you, do we as a collective group here, individually and together, do we want to bring rejoicing to heaven? I mean, wouldn't you... I mean, what would you give if you if someone said, "Okay, it'll cost you a thousand dollars to get all heaven to rejoice"? Would you come up with a thousand dollars? Isn't that kind of the icing on the cake, though? I well, mean, the cake is okay, is you, getting the person who's in value that's valuable precisely and bringing that. Yeah. But whether heaven rejoices or not. Uh, is that the real reason why you're doing it? Well, but, the, yeah, uh, and let's, yeah, I, I understand your point, 
But let's remember, we sit here and we do nothing. And heaven is waiting to rejoice. What does that tell us? I'm not sitting here. I'm contributing to this program. And well, there are millions you. of people watching it. And someplace out there, good. somebody is repenting because of the good work that we do here. <laughs> Another reason why we, we, um, we, <laughs> we, we delay in spreading the gospel is because there's people out, here that don't, out there that don't think like we do. What do we do about that? Well, they're confused. They need me to straighten <laughs> them out. <laughs> if they just listen a little bit, we'd solve those problems. <laughs> okay. But are we so clearly grounded, so fully and carefully grounded in our teachings, so that if someone stopped, if someone stopped you on the street and tell me, said, okay, show me from the Bible why you think Jesus is coming back soon, you would say, Well, you know, that takes practice. Oh, I say. What are we trying to talk about here? <laughs> you have to, you know, to be able to pull up any footnote on any kind of a, anything. Mm -hmm. You have to, it takes practice. You have to, you know. And okay, shall I give you an assignment? <clears throat> do, you, do you think a person would, would ask that question like that? They will. Uh, they'll come up to, to yeah. you and say, here, show me in the Bible where Jesus is coming from, where, that he's actually coming. That now, why time, would they even ask that? That time is coming. Yeah, it's but not here right now, but it's coming. First I can, of all, they know that, some, that, that the Bible does speak about God. Mm -hmm. Okay. So why would they ask that question? It seems like the problem is going to be, they're going to ask it in a different way. They're not going to bring up the Bible at all. They're going to ask you all kinds of questions that okay. doesn't even speak about the Bible. Let me tell you about a man that I've heard about. I didn't know him personally, but I know about this guy. He was blind. He had trouble. He had a speech impediment. He couldn't speak very well. He, was, he stuttered. But he was trying to figure out what could he possibly do to spread the gospel. And this is what he did. Let's think about this. He would go up, to a house, go up to a house, he would knock on the door. Here he is with his stick. He would go up to a house, and he could see a little bit. Up the house, he would knock on the door. And he would say, excuse me, I'm blind. I have this book here, and it was the great controversy. I have this book here. Would you be willing to take time to read me a chapter out of this book? Hmm. And then he would start asking them questions about what they were reading. And he was by far the most successful evangelist in that whole church. Reminds me of, um, of a story that uh, I'm acquainted with. When I was a kid, they used to have <clears throat> some um, film strips and tape recordings that you could, some of you may remember yeah. these, and you could have the doctrines and so forth. And there was a gentleman <clears throat> in this congregation, it wasn't mine, but it was a congregation with which I was familiar, and he had um, some very serious disabilities. Um, and I don't know what they were, but a, a, a very serious cleft palate. He couldn't speak and those kinds of things. <coughs> and he, he got those things, and he set them up out in his front yard like a drive-in theater. <laughs> and people, you know, people came, and uh, he got converts that way. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, Ken, the, the fact that people aren't, uh, and I, I'm afraid to ask this question because it's, self, it's kind of self-incriminating. <laughs> <laughs> We're pretty good at those kind of questions. Yeah, but, you know, is it, I wish, I wish I could ask this some other way, but is it, I'll just ask it this way, is the fact that people are not coming up to me and asking me those kinds of questions, is that, is that saying something about me? Yes. Probably says more about them, though, that they, that they have no need. Or they don't think they have a need. That's also true, but I, I absolutely am certain that if we were prepared to give the kind of witness God wants us to give, He would bring the people to us. That's a good point. I, I think both Gary and what you just brought up, you can often pick up just on the tenor of somebody's basic conversation if you bump into them in a bus or sitting next to somebody in an airliner. You can often direct, you can pick up on little things. Mm -hmm. Ari, and, and this is no, uh, I'm not looking for uh, 
hurrahs, but I remember distinctly, and in fact I have thought about it often one night many years ago in a state hospital in Australia, it was night shift, a psych hospital, and it was a co-ed unit. I was senior man, there was a female staff member, and, some, and it was one of those rare, rare nights when it wasn't busy. Mm -hmm. And this young woman, she said, I see you don't smoke. And that's what started it. Before that shift was over, we'd gone from creation to the second mm -hmm. coming. Mm -hmm. And she kept asking questions. She said, I've, I've never heard anything like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, later on, I heard that she left and gone with her husband to England, never heard sight nor sound, but I've often wondered. And yeah. it was just from one or two little simple questions. Mm -hmm. You and Cole Porters do that, selling books, comment on a lady's garden, or like a dog or something. You're going to be surprised what yeah. you can turn up. I, c I can remember some years ago a family member of mine uh, who and I were going to watch it because we're about to run out of time here, but uh, she, uh, she asked me, she's not an Adventist, she said, what, you know, what is it that Adventists believe? And um, mm -hmm. that was a time when we were talking about uh, all the uh, um, uh, righteous is by faith and you know and all of this stuff which was a big trend here a few years ago and probably still is and uh, her response was oh well we believe that which was true mm -hmm. and and uh, I wish and I may work up an opportunity to bring that up again but I wished I'd had uh, you know I have participated in this program and in another program that we have word pictures and so forth the time that I've been going to uh, the, the, uh, that's the reason I come and participate in these. I, I learn so much about those kinds of things, and those have helped me kind of reformulate about yeah. some of the things yeah. that are important to Adventists. And uh, I think my answer would be a little different. Uh, I know it would be different now. Ellen White said in Christ <clears throat> Obulus's page 210, these words, When you see yourselves as sinners saved only by the love of your Heavenly Father, you will have tender pity for others who are suffering in sin. You will no longer meet misery and repentance with jealousy and censure. When the ice of selfishness, that's an interesting expression, is melted from your hearts, you will be in sympathy with God and will share His joy in the saving of the lost. Christ taught you lessons 210. So how does God view this one lost world? Do we have any inkling of the way he feels about it? Do we feel any small, any tiny little part of, of that? John 3, 16. Mm -hmm. John 16, 25 and 26. Yeah. 15, 15. Well, that's, if, we, if we use those parables about the lost sheep and the lost coin, uh, it's not necessarily this world. It's, it's, even if there's one here. Yeah. Well, the disciples, and again, you can read about this in Acts of the Apostles, they kicked themselves all over the place after Jesus was gone and they finally realized what it was all about. Said, Why didn't we ask him? These are her words again. These days of preparation were days of deep heart searching in preparation for the, what turned out to be the Pentecost. The disciples felt their spiritual need and cried to the Lord for the holy unction that was to fit them for the work of soul saving. They did not ask for a blessing for themselves merely. They were weighted with the burden of the salvation of souls. They realized that the gospel was, be, was to be carried to the world, and they claimed the power that Christ had promised. I mean, suppose there were 12 of us here, sitting around this table, and someone said, okay, your job is to carry the gospel to the world. Now go and do it. I mean, what would you say? That's, that's, a, that's a, you know, it, it's, it's mind-boggling. Well, but that is a message. Yeah. Not, not just a message to those 12. It's a message to everybody sitting around this table yeah. and everybody watching what's going on sitting around this table. Now, Jesus said that there's a way to bear fruit. Do you remember what he said? <clears throat> John 15. There's a whole, we don't have time to read the whole thing. But it's the story of the vine. And he says the way to bear much fruit is to make sure you stay connected to the vine. If we are branches, our job isn't to work harder at going out there and maybe misrepresenting God. Our, 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 our job is to get so excited about the message by being connected to that vine 
that when we go out, we'll say the right things and the Holy Spirit will bless what we have to say and people will come in. In work with his first disciples, Jesus found that the hardest task of all was to get them to unlearn many of the things they had believed were true. I mean, the, the obvious example is the idea that the Messiah was coming to do what? Help them beat the Romans, right? And he, he, they were still talking about that after his resurrection. Is this the time, Lord, when you're going to give the kingdom back to Israel? Acts 1.6. Still people asking that question. Yes. Yeah. So what about it? Is it more difficult to unlearn wrong lessons or to learn new lessons? I think one's a two-step process and one is the other one's only a one-step. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Um, how many wrong ideas do we have? How many right ideas do we have? Yeah. <laughs> well, we know for sure that we have been told there are three tasks. We need to study our Bibles, we need to pray, and we need to witness. And the witnessing is necessary because it's going to send us back to study our Bible more and to pray more. And then there's going to be more witnesses. It's, it's a, it's a self-feeding process. Well, we're running out of time, as Jay has already mentioned. Um, there are a lot of things that go into preparing a harvest. You've got to prepare the soil, you've got to plant the seed, you've got to fertilize, you've got to da-da-da. So we shouldn't just say, where are the harvesters? Sometimes we need to do some planting. And sometimes we need to pre be preparing the soil. All those things that are need, things that need to happen. Think about how you would feel if you yourself had the privilege of actually bringing someone into the church and see them rejoicing in the gospel. Wouldn't that make you happy? Remember, we said the angels in heaven are rejoicing. Shouldn't we be rejoicing? What is your church doing to spread the gospel? What are you doing to reach the people in your community? What does the community think about your church? Are, are they really impressed by what's going on? Do they want to be more like you? Do they, are, they, are they excited about what's happening in your church? I once belonged to a church where people from the community were flocking in to try to figure out what in the world was going on in our church. That's an exciting possibility. It's something we need to think about and figure out how to do it.